Hello my dear fellow Indians welcome to Lofty IS Today we are going to do the news analysis of the Hindu newspaper It's 12th August today So uh, here it is we have given the Facebook link to our page For all those who want to da take down the notes of, uh, this of today's presentation They can reach out to our Facebook page Where we would put up the consolidated PDF And you can simply take down the notes Anyways let's come to the important news pieces that were covered in today's newspaper so the very first important topic that was there in the newspaper is the economic survey it in fact the second volume of the second economic survey you must all be knowing that earlier both the volumes of the economic survey used to be released at the same time during the budget session but this time only the first volume of the economic survey 2016-17 was released and second the release of second volume was awaited so in this in today's lecture we will take up the synopsis of the second volume of economic survey and uh, i would like to tell you all that in few days after few days we would present a separate video that would have a very comprehensive analysis of the second volume of economic survey since this economic survey holds very significant importance for all those who are appearing for mains and this economic survey would occupy a significant portion of gs3 paper so that's why we plan to make a separate video on its analysis now this is the first topic that we're going to deal with the second topic is that mrs mehbooba mufti who is the cm chief minister of jammu and kashmir has met prime minister modi over a petition that has been filed in supreme court against the article 35a of the indian constitution now we would know, would know in this lecture what is the article 35a how it was added into the constitution it was definitely not added through the act of the parliament it was added through the presidential order through the presidential order you must take care of this that it was not through an act it was through a presidential order over which some contention arises across the nation now the third topic that we are going to deal with is that Mr. Pahlaj Nihalani who was earlier the chief of CBFC that is Central Board of Film Certification has now been removed and in his place another person has been appointed. We will see later on who that person is and why this person Mr. Pahlaj Nihalani was removed before his term was about to end. The fourth topic that we are going to deal with is the death of 30 children that has taken place in the in the uh, Korakpuk hospital which is you know the constituency of uh, UPCM Yogi Adityanath and it has taken place allegedly due to the abrupt stoppage of the supply of oxygen gas by the company who was supplying oxygen to the hospital now we would look into it that it is very important from the ethical point of view whether that company should have stopped the supply or not or if they had planned to supply stop the supply should they have not informed the hospital authorities that we are going to stop the supply at this particular time they had definitely they had given some warnings no one can deny that but before shutting down the supply they must have told the hospital authority that this is a particular time that we would be stopping the supply so try to make alternate arrangements had they done so we could we would not have lost you know 30 precious lives that is very important now fifth topic is regarding the controversies that surround the construction of dam first they have there are two things that we cover going to cover under this uh, dam constructions controversies now, the first thing is uh, there is a there's a scuffle that is taking scuffle means a fight that is taking place between Tamil Nadu and Kerala our Parambikulam dam project now the second thing would be envi environmentalists are protesting against installation of generator for Athirapelli project in Kerala we will see why they are protesting in our today's lecture sixth thing is Ayodhya case hearing from December 5 now Supreme Court has said that they would take up the hearing of Ayodhya case from December 5 so we would see why they have given time till December 5 why they have not scheduled it earlier and how the things are going to proceed after the hearing starts seventh topic is that supreme court had told government that the law prevention of cruelty to animal law itself a low cattle slaughter so how can you come up with a new rule that prohibits sale of cattle for slaughter so we would look into it in this lecture it's very important that there has been a war of words between united states and north korea 
so we will see what recently came out from the mouths of mr trump who is the president of united states and mr kim jong un who always tries to poke into the belly of mr trump so this is the eighth topic that we are going to deal with ninth topic is that india is very keen to run sri lanka airport there is a port uh, near hambatota there is an airport near hambatota port where chinese has very significant present and india wants that this presence at hambatota port can be counted by uh their presence at sri lanka airport which is an international airport now the 10th is mycin in is because see uh, m bank and idu has been sworn in as 13th vice president so in this we need to know that what are the uh, what are the important articles that are covered in the constitution or that are there in the constitution of india concerning the duties uh, appointment removal role responsibilities of the vice president of india the second thing is This is just a news that uh, madrasas of U P have been told to videograph Independence Day celebration. The third thing would be that uh, every year floods are taking place in North East. Yeah, uh, last year, all the Assam was completely marooned under the influence of floods. This year, not only no uh, Assam, but this time Tripura itself has been completely marooned, and almost six thousand people have been marooned in. the floods in the north is now fourth thing is that japanese ambassador to india has told in a seminar that unstable power in india unstable power supply in india is serving as a biggest investment barrier so this is what he has mentioned that if you could supply us with you know uninterrupted power flow then you can have greater investment in your country so these are some of the things that we need to take care of in today's lecture and as i have told you that who all those for all those who want consolidated uh, pdf of today's presentation they can reach out to our facebook page which is mentioned here and the description the link to which would be given in the description below this video now let's come to the first news piece that we are going to cover today first news piece is regarding the economic survey so i'm here i'm giving you a brief synopsis what mr Arvind Subramanian who is chief economic advisor has written all in this economic survey definitely we cannot cover all the things that he has mentioned in the economic survey in some 10 or 15 lines but for for that we would coming up a coming up with a different video so for the time being we are giving you a brief synopsis so that you could have an idea like how the things are going around in our country and what are the future prospects of the indian economy where we are going to head towards so uh, the first the first subheading under this economic survey is that mr chief economic advisor had said that growth is likely to be in the lower range closer to 6.5% like he earlier had mentioned that in his first volume of economic survey he has mentioned that the growth uh, rate would be somewhere between 6.75% to 7.5% notice he had mentioned 6.75% now he is saying that our growth forecast is 6.5% to 7.5% and he says that due to the new downside risks to growth the growth gdp growth is more likely to be closer to 6.5% remember what is this growth this is gdp growth so he says due to the new downside risks to the growth which which i am going to mention in this uh, article itself what are those risks that are involved so because of that he says that the growth is going to be closer to 6.5% now he says that indicators because of which he has been able to come up with this forecast are all pointing to the same direction of deceleration in growth now what are all these indicators these are credit growth index of industrial production gross value added manufacturing and investment now what is this credit growth for example if you are a businessman you have to make a new invest investment you would go to the bank you would take loan from them and then you would do the investment when you take loan from the bank you take credit from the bank and the banks have some credit growth so i would i am uh, if i am a, a banker i would give a loan to one businessman to second businessman to third businessman in this way my credit grow, growth is going to take place now this is the first thing Th second thing is index of industrial production this shows at what rate the industries are doing their production and are they growing or they stagnant how how they progress is taking place is monitor through this 
indicator that is index of industrial production third thing is gross value added this basically sh is uh, actually uh, shows our gdp so shows ki how much production has taken place in our country in volume now fourth is manufacturing and fifth is investment that you all know what does that mean now coming to the third point he says that in addition after since demonetization exercise has taken place now growth could rebound but it could rebound after the impact of demonetization only only if there is a clean up and significant deleveraging in the indian economy so basically what we need that we need to give some thrust impetus to the indian economy so through various policies also we have come up with gst that is going to integrate our economy in improve businesses so these are some of the basically he says that we need certain policy measures so that there could be a new thrust new impetus to the indian economy this is the third point he mentioned now fourth point is now we have to see what were those downside risk that actually led to this production um, uh, prediction that uh, growth is going to be closer to 6.5% first of all he says that because of the implementation of seventh pick commission report many states would have to shell out a large sum of money to pay their employees to pay central government employees as well as the central government would have to shell a lot more income to pay the central government uh, employees because of which they would be less left with le lesser amount of money for capital expenditure this is first downside and if we do not have capital expenditure definitely see if i do not have capital expenditure definitely i would not be able to create new assets if i am not able to create new assets definitely there would not be new uh, jobs or new employment because if i for example i if i create a, if i uh, set up a new factory definitely i would need cement steel other raw material to built that industry for that i would reach out to other industries to give me the raw material and when i would go there definitely they would employ more people so that production could take place uh, according to the demand and when i finally set up the industry i would employ people so job opportunities would also be created so in this way it is a good thing but implementation of seventh pay commission report would left me with lesser amount for capital expenditure so definitely there is going to be a cut in Uh, job opportunities job employment and also other things so this is the downside now farm loan waivers have also you know created a huge impact on the balance sheet of uh, budgets so budgets uh, are also left with lesser amount for capital expenditure so this is also the second downside risk third downside risk is that recent exchange rate appreciation has taken place now you would imagine when the appreciation has taken place that earlier 1 dollar was equal to 68 rupees now 1 dollar is equal to close to 64 rupees then why it is bad for uh, our economy basically it impinges it impinges that means it affects our earnings of our exporters in one way or the other and exporters uh, that i'm mentioning here are the exporters of india because you would see that uh, earlier they were getting good amount for the exports now because of the appreciation they would getting little lesser and the importers they would be earning more so with the exchange rate appreciation this would affect the earning of our exporters who are also already struggling because there is a global slump in demand so this is also the downside risk that is involved now another drag that he has mentioned on growth and demand is the rising stress in the telecom sector you all know that since reliance jio has Uh, entered into this industry it has created a huge disruption in the telecom sector and there is a huge war that is going on based on tariffs so now the war has shifted shifted from basically tariffs for calls to tariffs for data now every company is giving free calls but there is a war for data now the other stress factor is the power sector so the power sector early is facing uh, is re reeling under some kind of stress and there is possibility that its assets could turn into non performing assets later on because there is a new vogue that is vogue means new aura has been created new demand has been created for renewable energy so power sector is also re reeling under some kind of stress though these are triggered by events that 
Uh, all for example this disruption disruption has been caused by uh, reliance jio and the power sector is reeling under the you know impact under the new influence of renewable energy this is all good for our economy uh, in the long run but in the shorter run definitely this is co- going to create some problem in the indian economy now the fo- now this another thing that he mentioned was that uh, that nobody is able to understand why the revenue generation for the farmers is less he says that there is an undecided puzzle of a good good monsoon has taken place but still the revenue gen- generation of the farmers is not that good and that is a puzzle if you have a good monsoon they could have they have a very good production then even that even then why they are not able to have a good revenue generation so the problem is something that they are not able to understand but they uh, but they assume that problem is mainly due to the restricted market access to farmers although we have come up with electronic national agriculture market enam but still all the farmers are not aware of that still enam has not completely uh, has not become completely functionable all the uh, mandis have not been integrated to this platform so it is going to take some time and until then definitely farmers are uh, struggling for that even after good monsoon and also there is a weak demand or liquidity in the market because of which they are not able to supply all they produce to the right you know uh, for example food corporation of india or other agencies they are not able to supply that in uh, sufficient amounts some some production quantities left with them and because of the that they suffer losses now he says what we can do to improve the situation of farmer he said that we need to uh, carry up significant procurement that we need to streamline the procurement process that so that any of the produce of the farmer doesn't go waste second thing he says that remunerative and stable support prices that is they should be uh, ensured the farmer should be ensured that they would get something very significant a uh, price as a stable support price for their crop so that they should always come to the government agencies or to other private agencies who would give them an uh, an assured sum of money okay for the produce that they would uh, come up with now this is going to obviously reduce the risk of farmers earning now he also mentioned that uh, the time is ripe to think about it that uh whether we should give direct support to farmers or keep giving them indirect support to f- through fertilizer subsidy diesel subsidy so the time has come whether we should give them indirect subsidies or sh- which should, should we give them direct support in the form of cash to farmers so these are the things uh, that we need to take care of or we can debate upon these things for now and the time is ripe he says now he mentioned there has been some after these downside risk there has been some encouraging developments that has that are taking place in the indian economy definitely all is not going into wrong side some things are definitely going good so what is that good thing that is happening in the indian economy first of all the implementation of gst is a very good thing that has integrated the whole indian economy it has uniformed the market it has un- un- uniformed uh, the prices all across the country so this is very good most of the businesses have from informal to uh, they have shifted from informal or underground activities to now formal and more visible activities this is very good we we, we have more number of tax payers they are availing the input credit and uh, i think uh, later uh, we would create a new and exclusive video for gst also so that people who are coming who are new entrants to this examination they could effectively know what this gst is who we would do a complete analysis so that they could understand in a very layman language that what gst is so this is this would be done in a few days now what uh, other encor- encouraging development is taking place it is the idea of the government to privatize air india private air india has been reeling under a huge debt and that debt was definitely uh, paid through the tax payers amount but now the government was feeling that this is not financially viable to uh, to keep air india as a private uh, is as a public sector undertaking and they are now planning to privatize air india so there has been an in principle approval to that now other thing that uh, that is good is the action standard have been taken by the government to clean up bad loans there have been, there has been amendment in the banking regulation act so that that is good and that is helping the indian economy in some ways 
definitely that is going to help us we have a bankruptcy re resolution code also so that is uh, definitely going to help us in the long run now uh, also due to the demonetization there has been expanded taxpayers base also uh, GST has added to this point that uh, because of GST and because of uh, demonetization we have now a greater taxpayer base and uh, definitely we have increased digitization digitization has increased for all the people even the poor are doing uh, taking carrying out digital uh, transaction through Aadhaar enabled transactions now what further he said he said that there is a good thing is that there is a downward shift in inflation now bhangai has been reduced inflation has been reduced see uh, what is the uh, interval between which rbi tries to keep its inflation that is 4 plus minus 2 percent that means our inflation should remain between 2 to 6 percent see if there is very high inflation so people would not be able to buy so poor people would not be able to buy uh, products it would become difficult for them and also if inflation be, uh, goes below 2% then definitely if everything is uh, is being sold out at such a cheaper price then industries would not remain viable they would not be able to produce uh, goods because they would not be having significant profit and if, if they are not having profit how would they operate so we cannot have a very low inflation or you can say deflation or we cannot have very high inflation so we have to keep it somewhere between 4 plus minus 2 that is from 2 to 6 percent so he says that uh, for now uh, the inflation is somewhere around uh, uh, somewhere uh, close closer to 5% but we have the chances to bring it as low as 4.25% now this this is uh, you know a, a value addition point that we must know that gdp growth of india for the year 2015-16 was 8% after that in the preceding year that is 2016-17 the gdp growth was 7.5% and now chief economic advisor says that our gdp growth is going to be closer to 6.5 percent so let's see eventually what happens now the second important thing regarding economic survey is that earlier there was a huge cash uh, present in the indian economy now this now our indian system has been lighter by rupees 3.5 lakh crore of cash he says earlier there was some close to 14 lakh crore of cash that was circulating in the indian economy now after demonetization close to rupees 3.5 lakh crore of cash has been taken out of the economy and because this this has happened because digitization has actually increased so earlier if there was 14 lakh crore of cash circulating in the indian economy now it is only rupees 10.5 lakh crore that is circulating that is very good because digitization is taking place so you have financial trails you are a more uh, you can say you are good in paying taxes you always pay you are loyal to the nation and uh, you are behaving as a right righteous citizen so that is very good now in addition there has been number of uh, income tax returns have increased so definitely taxpayers have increased after GST implementation and demonetization so definitely tax base base has increased and uh, economic survey has basically tried to see the effect of demonetization on digitization across across the compli complete nation but he has divided the people into three broad categories he says first of all there are poor people these poor people are largely outside a digital economy but they began using dhar enabled transaction and they are also now helping towards digitization and re reducing the cash flow in the economy the second category that, is, that he mentioned is the less affluent people who have acquired jandan accounts and have rupee cards through which they do, do their digital transaction now the third category of people are the affluent people who are fully digitally integrated via debit and credit cards they are rich people they are or you can say middle class people so they actually are the affluent people of the country and who are using debit card credit card and doing, doing their digital transaction now the fourth point under this is basically you know that economic indicators that are released by the government they themselves do not include data from the formal sector so what we need to do we definitely need to 
foresee the effect of demonetization on the informal sector so how did our chief economic advisor do that he basically did it through two proxies so one proxy was to see whether the demand for narega has increased or decreased and whether the demand for two wheelers has increased or decreased so definitely after demonetization these were supposed to reduce so what happened exactly two wheelers demand showed a rapid decline following demonetization but that was only for a few period a small period of time and after 6 months the demand returned to the pre demonetization level and this was the first indicator pro first proxy that he used to see the effect the second proxy was to see the demand for manarega now definitely for the first 4 weeks the demand for narega reduced after demonetization but demand normalized after 10th week and subsequently grew sharply so the third thing uh, from this economic survey was to push for law to ensure transparency rules so basically the survey suggests a transparency of rules act as a possible solution so chief economic advisor says that uh, see in our country we have central government then we have state government then we have municipal corporations or panchayats as the case may be so they these organization would uh, uh, these uh, tires of uh, state machinery would release their own rules and regulations sometimes uh, for a particular situation for for example for solid waste management there is a rule that has been released by the central government then there is a rules rule that has been released by the state government and then finally the rules are released by the uh, municipal corporation or the panchayat so people are getting confused which rule to follow and sometimes these rules are coherent but sometimes these rules are also conflicting with each other and so people uh, fail to understand which rule to follow and sometimes it also happen this is the first case the second case is there might be a rule that is present in the public domain but it is not so well promulgated that people would come to know about it so people claim ignorance as defense to that but he says that this should not happen so what we need to do we need to ensure transparency of rules so that people so so that people would uh, adhere to them very strictly and uh, basically when we say transparency of rules it does not mean that the it does not refer to the content of the rule he further says that the ca says that it does not refer exclusively to the content of the rules but the ease of finding what the citizen is expected to do which is definitely going to improve the relationship between the state and its citizens now the fourth point the survey take is um, survey backs up model on loan waivers you you know that uh, united uh, uttar pradesh had recently given loan waivers to its farmers to the tune of rupees 2.2 lakh uh to some 2.7 lakh crore between this interval now Eco- economic survey says that other states would definitely follow the footsteps of uttar pradesh example and waive farm loans it is said uh, it further says that other states will would give loan waivers to small and marginal farmers to the tune of rupees 1 lakh uh, crore i'm sorry for that 1 lakh crore and uh, an upper bound of loan waivers at the all india level would be between rupees 2.7 to 2.7 lakh crore so this is the example that other state might emulate emulate means copy the service says that definitely when you do the waivers it has some effects on aggregate demand how does it affect how does loan waiver affect our aggregate demand definitely our private there is an impact on private consumption via increases in private sector net wealth so see when you give loans to the farmer now they are not required to pay back loans to the bank so definitely they have more cash in their hands now so that would uh, uh, increase private sector consumption second thing is private sector impact via changes in government expenditure so definitely when the loan waiver has been given by the government they are left with less amount of cash for capital expenditure so there would be a fall in capital expenditure so there would be definitely less capital expenditure but government at the same time could increase its tax base or taxes you can say they could increase the taxes so this could be a second impact third impact is crowding out impact via higher borrowings by state government now as you see uh, i would give you uh, the meaning of crowding out impact see what happens when the governments take loans from the banks banks are, are left with lesser amount of money to to uh, lend it to the business businessmen so what happens eventually when businessmen ca- cannot take loans from the banks they are left 
uh, with less amount of money to take uh, loans from the bank they cannot have new investment and once they do not have the new investment they cannot generate new employments right and with this even if they have uh, previous empl uh, employees they would be forced to shun out few of them they would be forced to remove some of, uh, some of them so that is basically crowding of impact via borrowing by state government now the fourth impact is going to be crowding in impact uh, via higher credit availability as bank NPS fall so the fourth thing is going to be that once uh, the waivers has been given so that means uh, balance sheet of the banks has been cleared off now there is no NPS so definitely there would be now a clean balance sheet with the bank so they would be in a position to give more credit to the businessman so these are the four uh, impacts that are going to take place due to the loan waivers now the fifth thing that uh, economic survey talks about is the norms that we have for airlines to fly abroad see economic survey says that we need to have a mix of protectionism he says it's good to have protectionist measures so that our domestic flyers who are flying from one state to another they should not suffer but at the same time we need to give provide liberal norms so that our airlines who are indigenously you know uh, some airlines uh, which have started their business first in india they should not suffer uh, in the international market <clears throat> and uh, liberal norms need to be introduced for flying abroad to bolster their share to increase their share bolster them to increase their share in inter international air traffic now he says that indian domestic airlines have a very low share in international traffic and that is only close to 38 percent of people uh, for all the people who fly in and out of india only 38 percent is taken care by the domestic airlines he says that need to be you know improved and why are airlines are suffering he says that the factors like foreign airlines utilizing the six freedom of the air now we need to know what is the six freedom so six freedom is for example you you look at this point six freedom is for example there is a uh, airline called emirates this airline belongs to uae now this airlines operates flights between india and uk but it stops at dubai which is its home state so this is actually a six freedom utilization so uh, economic service says that foreign airlines are making use of the six freedom of the air which indian airlines are not using as of now very significantly also there is expansion of capacity entitlements under bilateral air service agreement with foreign countries so he says the expansion of capacity entitlement so when we have bilateral air service agreement between two countries then we have uh, then we give complete freedom to both the countries to increase their capacity so but he says the free, the the benefit of this is mainly taken by the foreign carriers indian airlines are not utilizing it to the fullest and in fact their own capacity entitlements they there has been lower utilization for their own capacity utilization for example if i fly a uh, uh, flight between india and uk the airline of the uk which is flying between india and uk it is taking complete utilize it is making complete utilization of the capacity entitlement for example if uh, they can fly, uh, like fly 100 people they are making at least 90 people to know uh, use their flight but indian airlines for example uh, uh, Air India is not completely utilizing its capacity entitlements. Now, also earlier we had 5 by 20 rule, but the 2016 aviation policies policy came out with a 0 by 20 rule. That means uh, we we need not have any experience. We can come up directly, but we need to have a fleet of 20 airlines that are operating domestically first of all we need to have 20 airlines that are domestic uh, operating domestically then we can take other airlines for international operation this is 0 by 20 rule that has been introduced in 2016 aviation policy now uh, he says uh, that uh, six freedom that i have actually ex already explained is constituting actually 61.14 percent of the total international traffic and indian airlines definitely need to make use of it now he further says that the survey uh, further says that the government should focus on building its own aviation hubs it says actually india is placed uh, very 
गुड इन जोग्राफिक जोग्राफिकल सेंस एज जियो पोलिटिकल जियो पोलिटिकल लोकेशन इज वेरी गुड इट इज एज गुड एज ऑफ दुबई और सिंगापुर बट ही सेज दैट इंडिया नीड टू हैव वेरी यू नो ओन एविएशन हब्स वी नीड टू बिल्ड गुड इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर दैट इज वॉट वी नीड टू डू ऑल्सो द सर्विस इज दैट अर्लियर वी हैड यू नो फाइव एंड ट्वेंटी रूल विच रिक्वायर्ड कंपनीज टू हैव वर्क फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस एंड ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी एयरप्लेन्स बिफोर दे कुड फ्लाई इंटरनेशनल नाउ वी हैव कम अप विद जीरो बाई ट्वेंटी रूल वेयर वी आर रिक्वायर टू वी विल वी डोंट नीड हैनी एक्सपीरियंस बट वी एटलीस्ट नीड ट्वेंटी प्लेन्स इन द डोमेस्टिक सेक्टर बिफोर गेटिंग द राइट्स टू फ्लाई ऑन इंटरनेशनल रूल्स दिस वॉज ऑल अबाउट इकोनॉमिक सर्वे वी हैव Uh, I have tried to cover most of the essential things in this economic survey, but still, I would tell you that in a few days' time we would come up with a comprehensive analysis of economic survey. So stay tuned, tuned to Lofty IS. We are definitely there to help you out. And for all those who are going to appear for the mains, this second volume of the economic survey is going to have a huge impact in the final paper. So stay tuned to our channel. We will come up with definitely something very awesome for you all people. Now the second topic is that. जेएन के चीफ मिनिस्टर मिस महबूबा मुफ्ती हैज मेट प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी ओवर अ पिटिशन पेंडिंग इन सुप्रीम कोर्ट अगेंस्ट आर्टिकल 35 ए नाउ वेयर इज दिस वेयर डज दिस टॉपिक होल्ड इंपॉर्टेंस इट होल्ड इंपॉर्टेंस इज जी एस टू पेपर यू मस्ट हैव सीन दिस टाइम दैट देर वॉज अ क्वेश्चन वाई बेस्ड ऑन सिक्सटी नाइन्थ अमेंड कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट विच वॉज रिलेटेड टू डेली सो दिस आर्टिकल थर्टी फाइव ए माइट बी आस्ड इन प्रिलिम्स और इन मेन्स पेपर सो यू मस्ट कीप अ क्लोज आई ऑन दिस सो वॉट एक्चुअली इज आर्टिकल थर्टी फाइव ए आर्टिकल थर्टी फाइव ए बेसिकली गिव्स परमानेंट रेजिडेंटशिप स्टेटस और राइट्स परमानेंट सिटीजन रेजिडेंटशिप राइट्स टू द पीपल ऑफ द स्टेट ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर इट मीन्स ऑल दोज पीपल हु आर द डोमिसाइल ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर स्टेट हु हैव स्टेट सब्जेक्ट ऑफ जम्मू एंड कश्मीर स्टेट रिमेंबर स्टेट सब्जेक्ट इज अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट टर्म दे हैव दैट विद दैम सो ऑल दोज पीपल हु हैव पोजेस्ट आइदर स्टेट सब्जेक्ट सो दे कैन बाय लैंड इन जम्मू एंड कश्मीर स्टेट एंड एनीवेयर in the country that we all can do but people who come from other state for example if a person comes from punjab he wants to buy a land uh, in any part of the country he can do that but he cannot buy land uh, in jammu and kashmir state that is a right that is exclusively given to the citizens or to you can say the domicile of jammu and kashmir state so it actually prevents outsider outsiders from owning property in the state this is the first point now why is this debate uh, raked up in the supreme court the debate is centering around the question that men do not lose their right to own property or right to inherit inheritance if they marry someone outside but but uh, the women if they marry anyone outside the state so they would lose their right to own property or the right to inheritance so this is the point point of conflict uh, that is being raked up recently among the people across the whole country now miss mufti uh, actually met mr modi and she assured the people so that the political turmoil in jammu and kashmir state could settle they she assured that uh, any discussion on this special provision for the state would be based on the agenda of alliance now you need to see what is this agenda of alliance between the pdp and the bjp state because now this has been you know <coughs> mentioned in the newspaper now you need to see completely what all is constituted in the agenda of alliance there are very various things first of all there should be a status quo maintained in article 370 second we would uh, not completely withdraw afspa but definitely uh, Uh, remove certain areas from the disturbed areas act and try to remove afspa from certain areas uh, step by step so there are various points that are covered in agenda of alliance you must read it completely and if you uh, if you want us to do that you can reply down below in the comment section we will definitely do it for you no she says that any uh, discussion that would take on article 35a would be based on agenda of alliance which is the underlying document to govern the state under the present coalition now this is this was the second news that is important uh, from the perspective of gs2 paper and from the perspective of prelims 2018 as well 
Now the third topic is that Mr. Bhalaj Nihalni has been removed as uh, chief chairperson of Central Board of, Board of Film Certification. This topic would is useful for uh, GS2 paper regarding statutory, regulatory, constitutional, and quasi-judicial bodies. So uh, and also from the perspective of uh, prelims because you must have seen that uh, this person was always in news for for some controversial things that he did now he has been replaced by prasoon joshi who is going to be the new chief of cbfc cbfc is central board of film certification now uh, why mr nihalni had been in uh, controversies first of all recently you must have seen that there was a movie released by uh, directed by madhur bhandarkar Hindu Sarkar that was based on emergency and he had demanded multiple cuts in that. After that, he uh, there was a movie released on lipstick under my burka. There was a movie released as lipstick under my burka and that was basically dealing with the uh, 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 you know the feminism and uh, the sexuality of a female. So. Uh, he also had uh, given a complete refusal to clear that movie so these were some of the controversies that were surrounding this uh, person now now this very important news piece is regarding the deaths or death that deaths of 30 children that has been you know taken place in gorakhpur hospital mainly due to the abrupt stoppage of the supply of oxygen gas by the company who was actually supplying oxygen gas to this hospital so what actually happened uh, this company had been giving uh, had been giving uh, warnings to the hospital that our supply is going to run short and you and there was an you know uh, outstanding dues amounting to almost 70 lakhs that was supposed to be paid by the hospital to this company so that this company could also pay to the agency from where they were acquiring gas so uh, what happened since this much of uh, outstanding amount was there so they had they actually uh, backed out from supplying oxygen gas abruptly uh, this becomes important from the point of gs4 paper because the question can be framed whether it was ethical for them to uh, uh, abruptly stop the supply or when they were about to do that ha should they have not approached the uh, concerned hospitals uh, chief or you can say principal to tell him that at this particular time we are going to stop the supply so you must take care what to do and what not to do and the principal might have reached out to the district magistrate definitely there were some warnings given but they should not have done it abruptly they should have been some you know uh, humanity that should have struck their mind and had some humanity struck their mind we would not have lost such 30 precious lives of our you know of children now wh why this uh, article is important from the perspective of gs2 paper is that many of the kids who died there were undergoing treatment against japanese encephalitis which is a disease you can uh, write in the comment section below that which uh, mosquito causes this disease so this is actually a viral disease which is caused by a mosquito so you can write in down, write it down in the comment section below which mosquito causes that so uh, uh, there was you know a, a very a very important campaign drive that was launched against this disease by upcm itself uh, mr yogi adityanath and a lot of uh, di uh, mortality has been taking place because of this disease so this also becomes important that kids were going uh, undergoing treatment against this disease and they were uh, what we can say since investigation has been ordered so we'll see what actually had happened but now they say that it was mainly because of the stoppage of a supply of oxygen so we'll see what exactly had happened now fifth point topic is regarding the controversies concerning the construction of dams see there is always a conflict between two states you must have seen recently that there was a conflict between Jammu and Kashmir state and Punjab state regarding the construction of Shahpur Khandi dam you should also pay attention to this Shahpur Khandi dam because it was very much in news and now PMO has interfered uh, in this um, matter to restart the work on this project so uh, I, I basically I mean to say that there are always a conflict between two states or uh, by between environmentalists and the state authorities are going to take up 
the construction of dam so this time the scuffle has taken place you can scuffle is basically a fight that has taken place between Tamil Nadu state and Kerala state our Parambikulam dam project so what happened exactly that uh, there is a project called Parambikulam Aliyar project so this uh, both the states are required to share some water uh, and uh, the water that is uh, taken by the Kerala state is directed towards the Chittu dam but because the but because uh, as a CM uh, of Kerala state uh, mentions that they were not given legitimate share of water by Tamil Nadu state and because of that Chittu dam is suffering and eventually what is going to happen Palakkad area in Kerala is going to come under very uh, is going to face severe shortage of water that is going to affect farmers and that would be very catastrophic for the state so we need he says that we need to take this issue with the uh, Tamil Nadu and we need to keep in mind that this should not be taken as an emotional issue but amicable solutions need to be, needs to be find out through good discussions fruitful discussion this is the first thing and uh, you can write down in the comment section below that which river uh, over, over which river is this project located so you can write down uh, uh, like over which river Parambikulam project is located so you can write down in the comment section below so the discussion keeps uh, remains interactive now the second thing is that environmentalists are protesting against installation of generator for Athirapelli project in Kerala you you know that uh, Athirapelli hydro project is located over Challakudi river in the state of Kerala now what exactly had happened that uh, uh, Ministry of Environment Forest and Climate Change had given the deadline to Kerala State Electricity Board that they need to commence the construction work on this on this project by August 18 at least they should commence the work uh, for the construction of Athirapalli project by August 18 and this was a deadline that was set by the MOEFFCC so what uh, Kerala State Electricity Board did, they actually installed a transformer near the project in order to show that they have commenced the work but they cannot do so because there is already a writ petition that is pending against the project at Kerala High Court and without going through a, p a proper tender process, how can they install the transformer? These are, these are some of the queries that are raised by the invent environmentalists. Now, further, it says, the environmentalists say that this hydro project is this Athirapalli Hydro project is going to be seventh dam. Remember, this is going to be seventh dam located on the Chilla Kudi River. So, if that happens, then definitely uh, construction of dam reduces the flow of water. So, that is definitely going to adversely affect the flora and fauna in the region. And also, that uh, some experts uh, on Western Ghats ecology they had mentioned that 130 hectares of forest land is going to be you know uh, cleaned up for this project and this is definitely going this project is definitely going to affect the Athirapalli waterfall as well now the sixth news is regarding uh, the Ayodhya case so you all know that Ayodhya always remains in news because uh, uh, Hindus want that uh, Ram temple and Ram Mandir uh, should be constructed there because Ayodhya is a birthplace of uh, um, uh, God Rama and Muslims want that the Babri Masjid should be constructed there uh, which was built there uh, and was raised down by the car sevaks in 1992 and there is a third uh, Akhada uh, third party which is Akhada they also want their own, own demands to be fulfilled so the Supreme Court mentioned that uh, they have scheduled December 5 to be the day of hearing when Ayodhya case hearings would start and this December 5 actually marks the eve of the 25th century uh, 25th anniversary this actually marks the 25th anniversary of the demolition of the 15th century mosque which was constructed by write down in the comment section below with this Babri Masjid was uh, constructed by uh, so you can uh, uh, write down in the comment section below who had actually constructed this Babari Masjid and this was demolished by Kar Sevaks on December 6, 1992 and on the eve of this the actually uh, the case uh, hearings are going to begin this is just a mere coincidence that court has decided this date which is coinciding with the anniversary otherwise court had no such intention 
to you know fix the date to be as such now why court has decided december why not august september october or so many months that are going to come in between basically court wants that until then the various parties that are involved in this case they should translate the documentary evidence which is present in the form of script uh, or records uh, which are dating back to several centuries and written in various languages they should be written uh, they should be translated to the court's language that is in english now the courts want that to be done until the hearing starts now the court has said that once they would start the hearing they would first listen to the appeals on the original title suits and then they would hear a writ petition that has been filed by the bjp leader who is mp of rajya sabha mr subramanian swami who has alleged that the right to work, worship at ram mandir is his fundamental right so write down in the comment section below which all articles of the indian constitution deal with the right to worship so this was the sixth topic that we dealt with now the seventh topic is that supreme court has mentioned to the government that law itself law which law this law is uh, prevention of cruelty to animals act law itself allows cattle slaughter so supreme court says that if slaughter slaughtering cattle for food or religious sacrifice is allowed under the prevention of cruelty act then why you are coming with the uh, coming up with a new regulation that bans the sale of cattle for slaughter in the new uh, you, they have come up with new livestock market rules so government say, uh, so the supreme court says why you are coming up with new this livestock market rules to ban the sale of cattle for these purposes so this was a question asked by the supreme court on the other hand you see that prevention of cruelty to animal uh, uh, these these were the regulation that were recently released by the government the prevention of cruelty to animal regulation and livestock market rules of 2017 so you need to read more about it what this exactly at so this could be uh, of significance for people appearing in this year mains as well as for people appearing in next year prelims so these rules actually require a person coming to the market to give a written undertaking that he will not sell his cattle for slaughter see what generally happens that people sometimes bring the cattle to the market uh, when it has been left uh, as a drought cattle it could not produce milk anymore so they bring it to the market to sell it for slaughter but these rules have prevented any such event and now the court says that if you uh, prevent slaughtering cattle for food or religious sac sacrifice which is allowed under the prevention of cruelty act so this is basically this actually means an interference of the fundamental right of the person who cannot sell his cattle for slaughter to carry on trade this is an interference to uh their fundamental right to carry on trade protected under the prevention of cruelty act so this was stated by the supreme court now the eighth topic is that us military is logged and loaded on north korea there is a great fight uh, basically war of words that is going on between us military or you can say united states president and the north korea's president kim jong un so recently president donald trump said that uh, us military is completely locked and loaded that means they are they are on board they are very much ready to take on pyongyang pyongyang is the capital city of north korea so they said that they are completely ready to take on north korea if they do any more mischievous and pyongyang says that uh, us is actually driving this korean peninsula to the brink of nuclear war why this korean peninsula because as soon as uh, because if the first attack has to be take ta uh, has to take place so definitely north korea is bordered by south south korea and south korea is a very good ally of united states so definitely uh, uh, an attack could take place on south korea or to J japan which is also very good ally of J uh, united states and uh, mr trump has maintained pressure on the north including his warning that the us would unleash fire and fury on pyongyang so mr trump ha has been trying to you know infuriate or tease mr kim jong un by saying such words and he says if they continue to launch missiles they continue to test their uh, weapons that then such fire and fury could be launched on pyongyang now uh, another thing that uh, mr trump had said that uh, after he had given his warning of fire and fury uh, pyongyang had still replied back very fiercely so mr trump had said that that uh, i that we believe this this fire and fury threat was not enough for you 
was not tough enough for you people so uh, who would take further actions but un's defense secretary tried to uh, calm down the situation by saying that mr trump's harsh words uh, that uh, by saying that uh, us united states still prefer a diplomatic approach to north korean threat they don't want to uh, undertake any war they don't want to go into a war kind of situation they still want a diplomatic solution to this problem and he knows he says that we know we all know that war is going to be catac- catastrophic not only for united states north korea or for the korean peninsula but for the whole world uh, you know so this is what uh, defense secretary has said now now what is going to happen us uh, united states military is going to undertake a uh, military exercise with south korea later this month because north korea says that it is finalizing plans to launch missiles towards guam now look it to into this uh, word guam uh, so Uh, in order to counter that threat of new north korea united states is going to undertake military exercises in south korea now we need to see where this guam which is a, a territory of united states is located actually if you look at the atlas you would find that guam is located somewhere between japan and philippines so if japan and philippines are on the straight line then guam is the apex of that triangle which is formed out of these three territories so guam is actually an unincorporated territory of united states that is located in the western pacific ocean as i have already mentioned to you now when was this uh, in um, when was then uh, occupied by united states this was actually during the spanish american war in 1898 that the united states captured guam on june 1898 under the treaty of paris spain agreed spain agreed to cede guam to the united states on december 10 1898 and, and guam is among the 17 non self governing territories of the united nations pay attention to these these can be you know uh, put in uh, uh, your prelims paper so pay attention to these no ninth important news article is that india is keen to run sri lanka airport so basically you know uh uh there there is significant presence of chinese on the hamban tota port which is being developed managed uh, and operated by them and india wants that uh, matalla airport which is the international airport of sri lanka which is all about 40 km south of hamban tota port be given uh, to india for its for its uh, infrastructure development and to operate manage its activities now uh, india what wants this matalla airport for uh, construction and management now beijing is definitely seeing hambantota port as a very important and useful link in its one belt one road initiative you must all be knowing about this initiative if you want to know more about it and want us to make a separate video on that write on the comment section below now what happened recently the sri lankan government has cleared its aviation ministry's civil aviation ministry's request for a committee committee to study the indian government's proposal see there were a total of eight proposals that were received by the sri lankan government but only the proposal of india alone has been told to be evaluated so that's a very good positive news for us now what india proposes to do we propose to operate manage maintain and develop this matalla airport through a joint venture in this joint venture india wishes to own 70% of the equity for 40 years and india is planning to invest 205 million dollar in this venture while sri lanka would invest close to 88 million dollar in matalla airport so this was all in today's news analysis but definitely before uh going anywhere we need to look into uh, our mcqs which i am going to discuss in another video